Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 10 of the YQuest series of 68,000 assembly programming tutorials. We're back on the Genesis, this time we're going to be using hardware sprites. Here's the new version of the game. Now last time, if you remember, we were just using the tile map, which gave everything a rather horrible 8x8 eight eight block chunky movement. Whereas now we're using hardware sprites, so we've got um, near per pixel scrolling of our sprites. Now uh, I say near per pixel because the internal coordinate calculations work in horizontal pixel pairs because it was based on sort of systems like the CPC, which were relatively low resolution. But still, we have very nice smooth movement. And today is basically going to be a tutorial on using hardware sprites as well as how I ported this game and made it work with hardware sprites when it wasn't originally designed to. Okay, well um, let's go over to today's source code and let's discuss the changes. So we're now using the YQuest 2 version of the game. There's been a few tweaks to the code, some to the common code. Firstly, the unused byte of the data definitions is now a hardware sprite number. Now if that is 0 or 255 then the graphic will be drawn with the old software tile map sprites. Uh, this is so that we can support systems that don't have enough sprites. Not really a problem on the 68,000, but it's there anyway. Now we're using zero or 255 because of the initialization. Most of the data resets to zero, but the bullet arrays reset to 255. So for simplicity, I never needed more than 64 sprites. Why not just use anything over 128 basically, or zero to be a software sprite. Otherwise, the number is the hardware sprite number we're going to use. Now the trick with hardware sprites is a numbered hardware sprite can only really be in one position on the screen. If we've got hardware sprite 1 here and we try and move it to here, then it will disappear. So if we want to have two objects on the screen, we use hardware sprite 1 and hardware sprite 2. So we allocate different numbers to them all. And that's what we're going to use hardware sprite number 4. Now, doing that, we're going to need to sequentially set a lot of objects to hardware sprite numbers. And we've got this set hardware sprites function to do that. We just pass a object, a pointer to the object array, a count and a hardware sprite number, and it will fill in all the hardware sprites consecutively for that bank of objects. Now we have another change to the code, and that is the main object drawing routine. We're going to check and see if we've got a valid hardware sprite number, which we effectively is 1 to 127, remember 0 and 255 are our uninitialized objects that haven't been properly allocated a number yet. So that is the common code that has been changed. The final thing is if we just look at the data defs, a player hardware sprite number is being allocated to the generic player object here. Okay, so that's the changes to the multi-platform code, not many. Um, I was kind of lucky that the way I designed things, it was relatively easy to convert it. Um, should have probably planned it that way, but it worked out basically perfectly anyway. So we're defining the hardware sprite number for the player here. And then most of our code is actually the same here. Now on the Genesis, we can use the same tile graphics that we're using for the tile map as the hardware sprites. The um, format's basically the same. So uh, we don't have to actually define any new bitmap graphics, load any in, transfer any new ones to bitmap memory. What we do have to do, however, is we have to do something known as link the sprites. Now the sprites on the Genesis are defined as being eight by eight uh, tiles. Um, now each one will be drawn, but each one has something known as a link. And this is a link to the next sprite. Now this doesn't chain the sprites together into larger blocks or anything like the PC Engine or the um, Neo Geo does. This is actually the draw order of the sprites. Now, if we have hardware sprite zero linked to hardware sprite one, and then hardware sprite one links back to zero, that will effectively mean there's only two sprites on the screen. So we can define a position for hardware sprite 13, for example, it won't draw because it's not linked into that chain. So we need to link all of our hardware sprites that we want to use to each other, otherwise they will never draw. Uh, didn't make, I made that mistake at the start, I forgot to do it, I forgot that's how it worked. Um, in a lot of systems, a link is related to chaining sprites together to make bigger software, bigger hardware sprites, but not in this case. So what we're doing here is we're just um, processing through all of the sprites we're going to need for the objects, the bullets and the player here, and we're just um, basically initializing them by setting them to off screen, but that is actually um, assigning the links. I'm linking the sprites even if they're off screen. So we're just initializing the sprites with valid links here, and that will actually get them ready to play so that if we only need, uh, say, sprite 10, but we don't need sprite zero, it will still show because zero is linked to one, linked to two, linked to three, linked to 10, and the final sprite in the chain is linked back to zero, and that's how the hardware knows which sprites to draw and which order to draw them. I guess if the layering, if you wanted hardware sprite zero to be behind one or in front of one, you would uh, put the linking accordingly. 
So that's how we are linking the sprites and that is very important if we actually want to see stuff, which we do. Now our clear screen routine is also blanking the hardware sprites, just moving them off screen effectively. We can see the blank hardware sprite function here. It basically moves to position 00, zero which is off screen. So we won't see the sprite and that will um, clear the screen because otherwise when uh, we died at the end of our game and we showed the title screen, the hardware sprites would still be there because clearing the tile map of course doesn't get rid of those hardware sprites. So um, that's quite important. Now, we have to allocate a hardware sprite number to each of the objects, of course, and um, where is that? Somewhere down here, maybe. Here it is. So we are selecting each of the object array types here, and we are selecting a hardware sprite number starting from two because one is the sprite for the player, and then this will sequentially fill them with consecutive numbers, so this automatically goes up to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then carries on throughout all of these other objects. So all of the objects are being given a hardware sprite number here. Now, if we didn't do this, for example, if I disable these two, well, now when we run again, you will see the player's moving nice and smoothly, and the player's bullets are pretty smooth, but look at those chunky enemy object movements, very, very bad there. That's because we've not allocated them any hardware sprites, so it's dropped back to the old tile map code. Quite handy if we want a game with thousands of on-screen objects, you know. The tile map can do infinite objects in theory, and the hardware sprites cannot. So being able to switch between the two here was actually very handy, and um, things like the, type, the text is still being drawn with the old software tile map code. So quite handy, quite handy indeed. Now, when it actually comes to doing a hardware sprite, we've got this new do get h sprite object code. Here it is. This is kind of similar to the old code. Basically, we are selecting the tile that we want to draw once again using get sprite address here to again to calculate the tile number that we want to show. We're then taking the x and y position here from the object definition. We're adding 128 here because that is the top left visible corner of the screen. So we need to make sure our hardware sprite coordinates match in position, in visible position to the software tile map so everything still works the same. And then we are going to define the correct chaining for the sprite. We need to make sure each sprite points to the next one. That's the way we're working things here. And the last object, which would be this one here because of the number of objects we're using, needs to go back to zero. So we're just um, dealing with that there. And then we're using this set sprite function, which if you're wanting to copy some of my code and put hardware sprites in your own game, this is possibly what you want to take. So this defines the hardware sprites. It basically calculates the correct memory location for the hardware sprite data. Now each hardware sprite uses a total of eight bytes. And so we're just shifting the memory address of the hardware sprite number here. The space of the sprite data is D800 here. And then we're transferring all of the data, the horizontal position, the vertical position, the width and the height in tiles, or you can chain multiple tiles together here to make bigger objects here, up to 32 by 32 pixels. Uh, the link, which of course we do have to set if we want things to work right. We've got the tile number here, that's the um, graphic we're going to show, the color palette here, the priority, uh, that's whether it appears in front or behind of the tile map. And by setting all of these, we will be able to set our hardware sprite as visible. And you can see the details just here. So that's really all there is to it, to creating hardware sprites on the Genesis. It gives us an easy ride by allowing us to use the same tile data for the sprites as for the tile map, quite handy. It just It's just a little bit tricky with regards to working with those link sprites. To my knowledge, the Genesis is the only one that does it that way. I mean, it's not a major problem. I just forgot how to do it. I forgot that was necessary. And so it took me a little bit longer than it should have when I was writing this code, but that's basically it. So of course you can go to my website and you can download the source code for YQuest. And as I say, you're welcome to do anything you want with it. So if you want to modify it and make a far better game and sell it for a hundred billion dollars, good luck to you. I don't think I could do that. So if you manage it, you deserve all the credit for that. But anyway, whatever you do, I hope you'll have lots of fun with the 68,000 processor and the Genesis and hardware sprites. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.